Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the December uh, Behavioral and Social Science Lecture. And my name is Deborah Ulster. I'm from the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. And I am uh, very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ellen Cromley from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, Department of Community uh, Medicine and Health Care. And also, we do have someone doing sign language interpretation who will uh, be here for those of you who might need it. Um, but if there is no one who needs it, she'll probably take off, so thank you. Um, so Ellen uh, is a medical geographer, and she completed a bachelor's degree in urban and environmental studies at Case Western Reserve University, and got her master's degree in geography from Ohio State University, and then a PhD in geography from the University of Kentucky. Um, I guess as a geographer, she gets around a little bit. <laughs> That's my little joke for the day. <laughs> um, so she spent, uh, she started off her career at the Hunter Health Plan in Lexington, Kentucky, a neighborhood health center, and also worked for the Appalachian Regional Hospitals uh, before her career as a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Connecticut. She has, uh, been active on projects that have been funded by many of the NIH institutes, including the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, she's also been a consultant on a project funded by the National Cancer Institute. So uh, I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time talking about her many accomplishments, because I think we'd all much rather hear from Ellen than hear from me. I will uh, say she's um, has also uh, participated in our office's Institute in System Science and Health last summer where she was a resounding success and I was there to see that. So um, today she's going to be talking about geospatial methods and health research and please join me in welcoming El Ellen Cromley. Thank you to uh, Ronald Abelis and Deborah Ulster for inviting me to speak with you as part of the NIH Behavioral and Social Science Lecture Series, and thank you for attending. My presentation considers geospatial methods as they might be related to the mission of the National Institutes of Health. That mission is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce the burdens of illness and disability. As Deb said, I'm a geographer, and we like to say geographers have a good excuse for being practically anywhere. And my field is the study of the Earth's surface as the living environment of human populations. As a medical geographer, I study geographical patterns of health and disease, the organization of health services and geographical factors affecting their utilization, and the application of geospatial methods in this research. This afternoon, we'll consider three main topics. First, for the, about the first 10 minutes, we'll consider some key concepts in geospatial analysis and the importance of this approach, why we need it. Second, the bulk of my presentation will be an exploration of a range of geospatial methods by showing how they have been used in health research. And finally, the last slide <laughs> uh, offers my ideas about some opportunities for advancing the use of geospatial methods at NIH. And I have provided a copy of my presentation in the form of notes pages showing each slide and then on the bottom there's the text of my remarks and this text includes citations to the journal literature and to some of the websites so if you're interested there's a copy here you can grab a copy or I'm sure Deb can help you find one so you can just kind of sit back and listen what are geospatial methods broadly speaking they are methods that take into account location or position in space there are a number of disciplines that take the location of phenomena and the distances separating them into account. Physics, astronomy, geography. These are examples of spatial sciences. The term geospatial indicates that the space of interest is the surface of the Earth. 
Geospatial methods are the key to understanding processes where results change when the locations of the phenomena being analyzed change. For example, the speed of infectious disease diffusion might change if people were spread farther apart in space. The best location for conducting a clinical trial might depend on the locations of possible participants and their neighborhood conditions. Geospatial methods cover a broad range of numerical methods, including measurement, spatial statistical methods, normative modeling, and others. But the common feature of these methods is that they require information about the locations of features of interest. GI science, uh, is the research field seeking answers to fundamental questions about how we represent and analyze geographic data. In Canada and Europe, the term geomatics has been used, and it's a similar in meaning to the term GI science. So geospatial methods are developed through GI science. Geographic data are data resulting from observation and measurement of phenomena referenced to their locations on the Earth. A geographic information system, or a GIS, is a digital system for integrating and analyzing geographic data. And the basis for integrating data in a GIS is location. So we're stacking these multiple layers of, of data together based on location. The science underpinning the development of geospatial methods, and many of the methods themselves, has a rich history predating technological developments in capturing, managing, and displaying geospatial data. At the same time, recent technological advances have pushed the development of the science and methods by making it possible to manage and analyze very large databases in new ways. There's no doubt that geospatial technologies and analysis methods have made important contributions to health research and public health practice over the last 30 years. It's worth considering for a moment some of the key milestones in the development of geospatial uh, and related technologies and some of the key health issues that emerged at around the same time. The first Landsat satellite for imagery was launched in 1972. That was the year I graduated from high school. So this, this slide is kind of like my life passing before my eyes. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the, for the 1980 census, the innovative GBF dime files were developed to help conduct the census in urban areas. The 1990s were a decade of enormous change in geospatial technology. The Tiger Line files developed by the census were one of the first digital spatial databases in the United States that covered the entire country. This decade also witnessed the launch of the World Wide Web for, the internet, for internet browsing, which led to the development of search engines such as Google. During this time, we had the first desktop GIS software, the development of open spatial data formats like shapefiles, and the creation of metadata standards for geospatial data. The completion of the global positioning system revolutionized our ability to capture data on location. The first GIS and health conferences in the United States were held with federal agencies such as ATSDR and NCHS taking the lead. The 2000s brought the first GIS and health textbooks and journals such as the International Journal of Health Geographics, which is an open access journal. And GIS software companies began to consider the health community, all of you, as a major market for their products. Spatial statistical software like Geoda, SatScan, and geographically weighted regression were also developed, some fully and some more loosely coupled with GIS software packages. We also saw the diffusion of GIS in health to every region of the world. Google Earth and Google Maps, health mash mashups such as Health Map, and smartphones, along with a range of other geo-enabled mobile devices, are changing how we access and view digital spatial data in the early part of this decade. Now, why does it all matter? I think I must have hit the uh, space bar there, sorry. Um, what is the value of geospatial methods in addressing the most pressing health issues of our day? Geospatial methods are important because they provide us with essential support for health research that we can't get any other way. And a simple example, I hope, will illustrate this point. The science of health research 
relies on data. And there are different ways of viewing data. Here we have two tables of data on students in classrooms. These tables are identical. That is, we have the same number of students with the same names, and each student with the same name has the same grade or outcome in the two classes. If we take the aspatial statistical view of the data, therefore also the same. We have the same n, the same frequency distribution, the same median grade, the same range of grades, the same relationship between grades and gender, and so on. However, if we take the spatial view of these data, when we look at maps of the classrooms, we see that the two classes aren't the same. In one, on the left, the grades are apparently randomly distributed. In the second, on the right, there's a clear spatial pattern of educational outcomes. Mapping helps us to visualize these patterns, and just such maps were made of cases on flights carrying passengers who were later diagnosed with SARS in 2003. Not their grades, but whether or not they got <laughs> sick, right? Geospatial analysis methods, so it's not just the mapping, but it's also the geospatial analysis methods are equally important as mapping and visualization because they help us to understand whether or not an apparent pattern could likely have occurred by chance. These are only two of the many maps we could create from that same table. That is, there are many ways the nine students could be arranged in the classroom space. We could also regard these students as representative of some larger population for which the overall proportion of grades was known, and we could arrange them based on that sampling assumption. These numerous maps form a sampling distribution of spatial patterns of disparities in outcomes, and we can use that sampling distribution to identify statistically significant spatial patterns. If we find significant spatial dependencies, what we call spatial autocorrelation, geospatial methods such as spatial regression analysis help us to take uh, these into account so that our parameter estimates will be unbiased. Otherwise, if you have the type of spatial dependencies on the right, it's entirely possible that you would be violating one of the underlying principles of multivariate inferential aspatial statistics, which is that the probability of one student getting an A is independent from the probability of some other student getting an A. And spatial methods help us to integrate these outcomes data with other data based on location so that we can understand environmental conditions or behaviors in the classroom that may have affected the pattern of outcomes. For example, lighting, noise, or cheating. Not only does the spatial view, view provide us with information we cannot obtain in any other way, that is through tables and traditional statistics, that information is important information to have because one of these two views better describes the reality we're trying to understand about processes, mechanisms, and outcomes. That's the first part of the talk. Now that we've reviewed some of the key concepts, we can explore how geospatial methods are used in health research by walking through the steps we would take to understand a health problem. At each step, we'll be looking at examples drawn from the literature. These examples will not all be drawn from a single study, but they should provide you with a sense of how geospatial analysis of a health question would proceed. The first step in any geospatial analysis of health is measuring location. That is, putting the features of interest onto the Earth's surface. Today, this is accomplished by using the global positioning system and other similar technologies that aren't necessarily satellite-based, through address match geocoding, or by acquiring digital spatial databases from secondary public and private sources, often by downloading data from a website. These data can be added to, or in the case of address match geocoding, created using the software functions of a GIS application. This map shows us part of the rich history of geospatial methods implemented before the advent of the new technologies. This map is from 1819, and it plots yellow fever cases near Old Slip in Lower Manhattan. And we have the East River along the bottom, and the street on the far right is Wall Street. So it's the very southern part of Manhattan, and we've rotated uh, the view. A version of this map, which is in the public domain, is in the National Library of Medicine, 
along with earlier yellow fever maps for cities dating to 1796. This is before Snow's map of cholera. These maps show highly disaggregate individual level data mapped by residents. They were made to investigate the cause of yellow fever at a time when its etiology was unknown. The cases on this map are also labeled to show the temporal order of sickening. So we know that time-space patterns were of interest in 1819. Unfortunately, we will not be able to discuss time and time-space methods today, but I hope you will be able to consider these in another lecture in your series. There are strong connections between medical mapping and the development of thematic cartography. So health mapping drove the development of cartography. Thematic maps are maps that show a spatial pattern. They're not the kind of map you use to figure out how to get from point A to point B. Although the spatial view of data is very powerful, it's also limited and potentially misleading. This is a map of motor vehicle collisions occurring on federal and state roads in Connecticut in 1995 and 1996. What you're seeing here are the dots representing the collisions. This isn't the roads, right? So that's, that's how many collisions there were. Uh, motor vehicle collisions are an important cause of traumatic injury in the US and many other countries around the world. Um, they're a leading cause of death in the U.S., especially among people under 35 years of age, and they rank third overall behind cancer and diseases of the heart in terms of years of life lost. Collision databases are interesting because they're one of the few sources of surveillance data reporting individual, environmental, and behavioral elements of the health event. The data for this study were drawn from the Connecticut Codes Project that stands for Crash Outcome Data Evaluation System, and these projects were funded by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The Connecticut DOT, Department of Transportation, geocoded the collision locations by longitude latitude. So this is the 124,053 collisions on federal and state roads in Connecticut in 1995 and 1996. And please take note of the scale. Connecticut's a really small state. It's about 50 miles north to south, about 100 miles east to west. We're about the same size as Harris County, Texas, which is where Houston is located. So we're talking about a really small space here. Once we've located the phenomena of interest, the next step in an analysis often involves calculating distance. Distance is a measure of separation in space, and it's a key geographic concept and a required measure in many geos geospatial methods, as we'll see. There are various ways we can measure distance if we're using locations on the geographic grid, a model of the globe, we compute spherical distance, measuring the arc of the circle that connects those two points on the globe. If we're dealing with projected data, which puts all this information into a two-dimensional planar space, we can calculate Euclidean distance, which you probably remember from high school, or st straight line distance. We can calculate taxicab distance or distance along the street network. GIS software functions enable us to calculate distances, and spatial analytic functions often allow us to specify which method we want to use when we're calculating distance. Different methods for calculating distance will yield different results. So here we apply three different methods for calculating the distance between a person's home and two different food stores. So distance measures of this type are widely used in studies of the food environment and obesity, for example. The Euclidean distance, by definition, is the shortest. The circle shows a quarter mile buffer around the home location as the crow flies. And note that store number two is just inside the buffer, and store number one is just outside of it. When we measure distance the way a person might actually walk it along the street network, uh, we can see that store number one, which is outside the buffer, is actually closer to the home than store number two. So it's important to pay attention to how distance is calculated. One way we can try to make sense of the mass of data we have before us is to aggregate the data. Geospatial methods help us to group observations based on spatial relationships. The point and polygon method of aggregation has been one of the most widely uh, used, and usually the polygons represent political or administrative units, like counties or something like that. So we take the points that represent a health event, and we use geospatial methods to determine which polygon, which county, which census tract, and so on, the point lies within. 
we add up the number of points within each area, and then we can make a map based on area. It's also possible to perform this kind of analysis on areas whose boundaries are determined in other ways. From environmental sampling, we might be able to identify regions where contamination is present or absent, and we could group individuals based on whether their residences were in a contamination area or not. We could also define regions based on flows in space or distance from an origin. In this way, we could find points within 30 miles of a health services facility as the crow flies or based on street network distance. We can also group polygons together. For example, we might group census tracts into counties or census tracts into health services regions. The approach taken in the collision study was to use geospatial methods to aggregate data in a different way. It doesn't make much sense to put these into counties or census tracts or something like that. So we wanted to find meaningful areas that would capture something about the process, which has to do with uh, breaking time and deceleration along a segment of a street network. So this approach was possible, the one I'm going to describe in a minute, because we had the collision locations available to us as points. What we did was, and I'm just going to talk about fixed object collisions. These are collisions where the car slides off the road and hits a fixed object like a telephone pole or a tree. Um, we used a distance of one quarter mile around the collision location on the street network. So if you can picture going to a collision and then looking at this direction <laughs> along the street network and kind of making a little rectangle around that, we can look at that collision and all the other collisions that happened in this area. And that was determined by actually looking up all the engineering tests and how long it would take you to stop a car traveling a certain number of miles an hour on a dry road after you hit the brake. So we generated these kernels or box windows around every single collision in this database. I'm, not, I'm just only going to talk about fixed objects and only the top 10. But um, because some collisions occur close to each other, when you define those areas, there is obviously some overlap or collinearity in the membership of those groups. So to get around that, we looked at the area that had the greatest number of fixed object collisions in it, and we took that and all of the neighboring collisions out, and then we looped through the data again and picked the next area, and so on and so on, to eliminate these overlapping places. And what we were left uh, with was these as the top 10 places with the highest frequency of fixed object collisions during that two-year period. Even though at this scale of the map, it looks like these places overlap, they are in fact geographically distinct. And the size of the symbol here reflects the number of all types of collisions within this area where we had a lot of um, fixed object collisions. And, and you can go through the entire database and create these kinds of areas. Now, um, the approach to aggregating the collision data was designed to avoid problems with using political and administrative units like census tracts to aggregate data. Those units have boundaries that are arbitrarily determined without regard to the underlying distribution of the phenomenon we're trying to understand, and they can mask spatial patterns. So going back to the little example of the classroom, if we decided to make three census tracts in the classroom, right? If we drew them on the left uh, and we kind of aggregated the data, we wouldn't see any spatial variation across those three census tracts. But if we drew the census tracts on the right, same number of tracts, same number of people in each tract, we would see a very clear kind of gradient in outcomes. So how data are aggregated geographically can affect the results of statistical analyses as well, not just the visualization. And this is what is known as the modifiable area unit problem. This problem has two components. There's a scale problem. This is the generalization that occurs as we aggregate areas into progressively larger units, like going from census tract to county to state and so on. And there's a zonation problem, which arises when we can partition the study area in different ways at the same scale. So this is an example of the zonation problem. There's a substantial literature on the modifiable area unit problem, and I've given you uh, references. There are no real solutions to the problem, but we can make an effort to use data at the most disaggregate level possible 
to address the scale problem, and we can create regions with intelligent boundaries. That is, boundaries that reflect the distribution of the phenomena we're trying to understand to address the zonation problem. GIS can also be useful in exploring the spatial structure of a problem. So the computer environment will let us experiment with different ways of zoning things and then look at the, the consequences of that. For example, this has real implications for spatial sampling as well. <coughs> it's important to understand that there are two types of spatial samples. A sample of space involves sampling some locations from the set of all places. When we select sites for environmental monitoring, like where we put air monitoring stations, or we select one or more study communities, we're taking a sample from the set of all places. Because there are an infinite number of locations on the surface of the Earth, it's time consuming and expensive to look everywhere, and it's probably not necessary to do so. Nevertheless, the design of environmental monitoring systems or the approach to study community selection raises important sampling questions. How many sites are needed and where should they be located? A sample in space involves sampling from a geographically distributed population. So every sample from a human population is implicitly a spatial sample. Whether you think you're doing it or not, you are picking people from particular places. And a random sample of all people will therefore not be a random sample of all places unless people are uniformly distributed, which they basically never are. So this means that there may be no one residing in an area of interest or that our sample cannot capture the variation of interest. Um, for example, let's say we're testing a vaccine for a health problem like Lyme disease, very important where I live. The risk for Lyme disease is greater in woodland areas than for people living in more developed places. Now, more developed places have larger populations. So if you just took a random sample, most of the time you would be getting more people who live in cities for testing your vaccine. Um, where the, and those people have a lower risk for acquiring Lyme disease to begin with. What are the implications of this for how these kinds of trials are designed? There's a little bit of literature that's coming out now uh, with respect to um, certain types of environmental health problems. Very important. Geospatial methods can help us explore this issue of what is the spatial basis of evidence. If the literature on neighborhood contextual effects on health is true and it tells us that you know, areas affect health, then where we choose to look is going to have an implication for what we see. So because so many health studies have been conducted in a limited number of places with a limited number of participants, meta-analysis methods have been developed to improve statistical power in the analysis of the data. And these studies generally do not consider where the studies have been conducted. Dr. Blair Johnson of the Department of Psychology and the Center for Health Intervention and Prevention at the University of Connecticut Stores has been working on meta-analyses of published studies of trials in African nations. And very strict inclusion criteria were applied in selecting the studies. They all evaluated efficacy of an interpersonally delivered HIV AIDS prevention effort that was initiated from 1986 to 2008. And the intervention was focused on a behavioral outcome relative to a control group or a baseline assessment. There were 93 studies identified and some of them had multiple parts to them. This map shows where the studies were conducted. Um, for some studies, location is reported down to a city or town level. Um, for some studies, only to a regional level. And remember, these are interpersonally delivered interventions, not like uh, public service announcements that would be broadcast over a large area. So most of these interventions happened in clinics, in schools, in very specific places, but we could only get these down to sort of like a, a city or town level. Um, the counts are mapped to the centroids of the city, region, or country, and the size of the symbol represents the count of studies that involved that place. So here, this is where we have these aren't just NIH-funded studies, um, but we'll be able to show you the map of NIH-funded versus other studies, and we could make an animated map that showed how these progressed through time. But this is where we have some evidence of the effect 
um, on a behavioral outcome of HIV AIDS interventions in Africa. Now, looking at the studies will permit Dr. Johnson and his team to develop spatial meta-analyses to analyze contextual factors like support for human rights or women's economic power or levels of income as factors that might inf uh, affect intervention efficacy and to investigate whether or not there are spatial patterns in intervention efficacy with more efficacious interventions being conducted in particular areas. Um, and it also helps, as you can see, basically just to identify where trials have been conducted and where they haven't. Perhaps the most dominant use of geospatial methods in health to date has been analyzing neighborhood context of health events, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this. But this involves using geospatial methods to put an individual in an area and take into account area characteristics in explaining the health of the individual. Hierarchical modeling is the primary method used in much of this research. This approach has made health studies more geographic in the sense that we know something about the local environment. But it has not necessarily made this research more spatial because we don't take into account this spatial autocorrelation or dependencies from one neighborhood to the next. And I have a citation if you want to follow up on this. So as a result, um, I think we sometimes see inconsistent results in studies conducted across different localities. Does the presence of a park lead to more physical activity or not? In addition, we have difficulties identifying groups of places with the same configurations of factors affecting health outcomes. So despite all of this detailed, spatially extensive data, many, analysis, many analysts are still falling back on aggregate or global methods of analysis, which do not help us uncover key spatial patterns of interest. Geospatial methods can be used to analyze spatial patterns and processes. I'm going to talk a little bit about patterns first. Spatial clustering methods help us to analyze spatial patterns in data, and there are a wide range of clustering methods. Some are global methods, and by this I mean they identify whether or not there's an overall pattern of clustering. Others are local methods used to identify the number and locations of individual clusters. And all of these techniques have in common that they rely on being able to describe the distances separating or the proximity of neighboring areas or health events. So this is a table adapted from geographically weighted regression, the analysis of spatially varying relationships. And it just broadly contrasts the idea behind global versus local statistics. Global statistics summarize data for entire regions, yielding a single statistic which is often aspatial and can provide misleading interpretations of local relationships. Local statistics, on the other hand, summarize data for individual places within, enti within entire regions. So you get multiple statistics, one for each place. These are potentially interesting when they're mapped, and they're useful for exploratory data analysis, for confirmatory analysis, and for building more powerful global models. The most recent versions of widely used GIS software packages are incorporating more spatial statistical functions for both global and local uh, analyses. For example, we can perform global and local clustering analyses. Or we can do an ordinary least squares regression. We can check for spatial autocorrelation. And then we can run a uh, spatial regression model, or we can do geographically weighted regression, in which spatial variations in the regression parameters can be observed. Moran's I is a global measure of spatial pattern clustering, spatial autocorrelation in data. Positive spatial autocorrelation means that like values are clustered together, like that classroom on the right. Negative spatial autocorrelation means that high and low values alternate in a kind of checkerboard pattern. Or we can have a random pattern of uh, values. Moran's eye was used here to investigate whether or not there was a pattern of overall clustering of average depressive symptom scores among community living elderly participants in a telephone survey conducted in New Jersey. And a significant pattern of positive spatial autocorrelation was found here. So the red dots here 
I mean that these are census tract centroids where at least one survey respondent reported a depressive symptom score greater than or equal to 10. And if there's just a black dot, it means there was a participant, at least one participant at that location, and none of those participants reported a depressive symptom score um, greater than or equal to 10. And the gray shaded areas are tracks with at least one participant. The big boundaries you see are county boundaries. Um, so what this tells us is a global, a global measure is, yes, there's clustering of depressive elderly people with depressive symptoms here based on residence. But it doesn't tell us how many clusters or where they are. The LISA statistic is a local measure of spatial autocorrelation. It stands for local indicators of spatial autocorrelation. And it measures the association between the value at a particular place and the values for neighboring areas. And there are different ways you can define neighboring areas. This map shows the locations of census tracts with high average depressive symptom scores that are surrounded by other tracts with high depressive symptom scores. So we're getting away from this thing of the census tract boundaries splitting up a pattern of interest. These clusters are statistically significant, meaning that it's unlikely that these could have occurred by chance. This method can also identify significant clusters where tracks with low average scores are surrounded by tracks with low average scores, kind of cool spots, or tracks with high average scores that are surrounded by tracks with low average scores, and so on. And we can also go back to the individual people and find individuals who had low depressive symptom scores, but they were living in tracks where everybody else was high and they were surrounded by high people, those would be really interesting people to look at because it's like what accounts for their resilience. With this understanding of data, we can design better studies investigating neighborhood contextual effects on depression, intervention trials, and service delivery systems. In addition to analyzing spatial patterns in data, we can use spatial statistical methods to investigate processes. Spatial statistical methods, again, take into account location. And I'm going to talk about spatial regression analysis as a global spatial statistic, and then we're going to look at a couple of examples of local spatial statistics. Global spatial statistics were effectively used to model growth and development of drug markets for methamphetamine in California in relation to changing patterns of enforcement. The researchers used zip level spatial data and simultaneous autoregressive mo spatial models to, co to correct for spatial autocorrelation of model residuals, which if uncorrected would induce bias in the parameter estimates. The authors eloquently expressed the value of a spatially extensive approach, and I'm quoting them. The scale of the market is not that of a single social network, neighborhood, or city, but rather that of neighborhoods within cities and communities across the state and across national boundaries, i.e. between California and Mexico. The results were consistent with two possible explanations for the observed patterns. An increase in methamphetamine use in rural California, that's what was observed over the time period. But this could have been to a kind of enlargement of the overall operation of this market with diffusion of, of meth labs to rural areas, or it could have been a displacement of the meth labs out of urban areas into rural areas where uh, enforcement could be better um, evaded. This is how you would formulate a spatial regression model. This looks pretty familiar to you, except the third term. The th that third term basically is pulling out of what would be just the random error term, the spatially autocorrelated error. So uh, we're, we're dealing with the spatial error on its own, and then we have still a random error left over. And here, the non-random spatial error um, which captures the spatial structure of the spatially dependent error, has lambda as the spatial autoregressive coefficient, or the error parameter. And what's in the summation sign is the sum of the spatial weights multiplied by the spatially dependent error with respect to observation i. And you can compute a spatial weights matrix, again, using different approaches, using GIS software once you have all the information um, in your software application. Returning to the study of collisions, we can look at how local spatial statistics were used to understand processes occurring at the various collision sites. 
Local proportions and local odds ratios were calculated to assess the importance of individual, environmental, and behavioral factors associated with collisions at different places. Are the same factors associated with the same outcome, fixed object collisions, across all places? So this is how we would calculate a geographically weighted proportion. This looks really fancy, but all we're basically saying is go to the kernel area and look at the proportion of collisions in this area that happened on a day when it was raining or when the road was wet or had a driver a certain age or so on and um, do this proportion just like we would for the state as a whole. If you want to, you can weight the uh, collisions based on where they are within this area, but I sim use a simple binary weighting where it's zero if it's outside the kernel area or if it's one inside. And then the geographically weighted odds ratio is basically doing the same thing. You're just calculating an odds ratio for fixed object versus other types of collisions based on some other dimension like road was wet or dry within this kernel area. Now, I know that you can't see all of these in detail, but if you get the PowerPoint, you will be able to see these. What I want you to focus on is the fact that these significant local proportions vary across this chart. So we have the top 10 places. Those are the rows. The state is at the bottom. And then we have whether or not it was a fixed object crash, rain or snow, on a dry road, daylight conditions, the driver was between 25 and 44 years of age, the driver was male, what the person was doing, in this case driving too fast for conditions. So for all collisions in the state as a whole, across the bottom row, which you can't read, only 24% occurred when it was raining, sleeting, or snowing. 65% occurred on dry roads, and 70% occurred during daylight conditions. So if you looked at this, you would think, oh, weather's not that big a factor in motor vehicle collisions in Connecticut. But, um, and with respect to age, drivers or pedestrians under 25 or older than 44 were at fault in 54% uh, of collisions, and 61% of the drivers were male. Now, these individual age and sex characteristics are also consistent with uh, collisions reported in the literature. But the analysis of the local proportions and odds ratios reveals different and variable patterns for these various high uh, collision frequency locations. Rows 2 and 6, place 2 and 6, very high numbers of crashes were fixed object collisions. And very many of these occurred when road surfaces were wet, when drivers were operating vehicles too fast for conditions. So in some places, if it's not a rainy day, we don't have crashes. But when crashes occur, it is a rainy day and the roads are wet. That doesn't apply everywhere in Connecticut, but if we're going to figure out what to do at these places to stop these health events from occurring, we need to know what the configuration of events is that's coming together in a particular location. And it may not be the same everywhere across the state. If you look at place number 10, there aren't any differences between the characteristics of collisions occurring at those places and the, the, the state. But if you look at place uh, number five, it has significantly different things going on there in almost every dimension from collisions in the state as a whole and also from some of the other uh, high fixed object collision sites. Local odds ratios reveal some additional patterns of interest and the value of using odds ratios in addition to proportions. So place six again, for example, was did not, the local odds were not significant for rain or snow, even though a lot of fixed object collisions, a lot of collisions there happened on, on rainy or snowy days. And what that suggests is all types of collisions occurring there, not just the fixed object ones, were affected by rain and snow. So I hope this, this gives you uh, the idea. And this leads us to the idea of spatially varying relationships. We can use geospatial methods to map data on the amount of time a person spends outdoors, for example. And that would vary spatially, perhaps. We can use geospatial techniques to monitor, model, and map geographical variations in air quality, for example. But it's also possible that the very relationship between the amount of time you spend outdoors, air quality, and health outcomes itself varies geographically. And if this is the case, we need to be able to find the set of places, or what we might call the spatial domain, where particular processes are, are at work. I don't want you to think 
that this is an example of what we call in geography exceptionalism, that every place is just so special and we can't make any generalizations. It's not that. It's that we need to search for the set of places across which a particular set of generalizations apply. And the generalizations might not apply everywhere. One of the important techniques we have available for investigating spatially varying processes is geographically weighted regression. And this is a model that evaluates <laughs> relationships among independent and def dependent variables in a way for particular places so that these regression parameters can vary spatially. And GWR was used in a study of mortality in the Atlanta metropolitan area. Socioeconomic status, race, and urbanization were significantly associated with standardized mortality rates across 431 census tracts. Local parameter estimates were mapped and I've given you the citation to this article. And low socioeconomic status, for example, was found to be particularly significant in estimating mortality in the northern suburbs of Atlanta. But it had a lesser and a less significant effect in the southern region of the study area. A neglected area in research on human health outcomes is the role of health services. So much health research, and as Deb said, I started my career in the health services side of things, is designed as if the structure and functioning of the healthcare system has nothing to do with the health outcomes we're observing. We need explicitly to address how the structure of the various healthcare systems, plural, in the US, state and local regulations on insurance, practitioner licensing and other components affect the patterns of health and disease we're trying to understand. And geospatial methods can play a role here too, especially by using spatial interaction models to evaluate accessibility to existing services. Don't have time to talk about that today, but I want to introduce you to something you're probably less familiar with, which is normative modeling techniques to locate and evaluate optimal locations. What's a normative model? Whenever we're trying to answer the question, what's the best, what's the worst, what's the least, what's the most, we're in the world of normative modeling. And the key elements of a normative model are an objective function. So if we say that we want to allocate patients from a set of demand sites to a set of clinics to minimize the total travel cost, the travel cost of you plus me plus you plus you to these clinics, that's our objective. It's our definition of what's best. In meeting this objective, we have a set of constraints. And here we're saying that every patient must be served, but you wouldn't have to say that. The number of patients allocated to a clinic can't exceed the clinic capacity. And the number of patients allocated to a facility can't be negative. That means we can't have a negative number of people going for service. This is called a non-negativity requirement, and most real-world problems have these. And, and then the structure of the problem gives you the data requirements. From this English language description of the problem, we can develop the model formulation um, using mathematical expressions. And you can look at that. And clearly, you've probably understood that we can use the GIS to present these data. So we can locate the, the patients here to the centroids of the towns. And we know how many patients are coming from each town. We can locate the clinics in a GIS, and we can put in data on their capacities. And we can use the GIS to compute an origin destination cost matrix that will tell us what the travel cost is for every person starting in one town and going to a particular clinic. Now, for very large problems, we can't solve these inside the GIS software package. We would have to use something like SAS OR or CPLEX or some other method. Small problems you can use using the solver in, even in Excel. And that's how I did this one. So this is the optimal allocation. And then we can bring these data back into the GIS and map what the assignment is. And again, this is the assignment which is mathematically proven to yield the lowest total transport cost of getting this number of patients at these locations to this number of facilities with these capacities. You can't do better than this. We all deal with this every day, right? We say things like only 24 hours in a day, can't be in two places at once. These are very powerful methods that have been 
uh, I think, somewhat neglected. So the total, the answer is, what is the minimum total travel cost? It's 301,614.2 miles. Once we've completed our analyses of health problems, we want to share our findings and data with others. And geospatial methods, especially over the web, play a really important role in helping us do this. The Malaria Atlas Project, which was initiated in 2006, illustrates just such a project. And we're, we're getting close to the end. I'm going to finish on time, I think. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I would encourage you to go to this, this website and look at it. Um, malaria is clearly not, uh, at present, a significant health threat in the U.S., but this project offers an interesting model of the kinds of work we could be undertaking. Mapping malaria is challenging because transmission intensity is geographically heterogeneous. Researchers interested in malaria realized that we did not have a good map of malaria prevalence, um, meaning the proportion of the population that was confirmed positive for malaria parasites. And this was making it difficult to evaluate the impact of different malaria control projects that were being implemented in different parts of the world. So they took more than 8,000 reports, kind of like a meta-analysis. They applied really strict inclusion criteria. And f uh, they integrated these temporally and spatially using geostatistics geostatistical methods, and a gridded population database, and they constructed a continuous, age-standardized, urban-corrected malaria prevalence map. Everything, the source data, how they did it, and the results in the form of maps and the data itself is all available for free on the Internet. So this is an example of a regional uh, limit and endemicity map um, which is downloadable in PDF format from the web, but they also let you download the actual gridded data in GeoTIFF format and in ASCII format. And a GeoTIFF is just a TIFF file that has information in it so that you can register it to its correct place on the surface of the Earth. So now they're serving up the data so that other researchers can use uh, these data for whatever they want to. More importantly, because they used geospatial statistical methods, and in Bayesian techniques, they were able to generate information about spatial error. So for some parts of the world, based on the underlying distribution of reports, where we have more reports, we're more confident that we know what the true prevalence is. So they also publish spatial error maps, and we really need to be doing a lot more work on spatial concentration and error. Um, the bright green area on this map shows an area of higher uncertainty in the prevalence data. And again, these are downloadable as PDF maps and in GeoTIFF and ASCII formats for the data. Finally, geospatial data on individuals does pose a risk to privacy and confidentiality of health data. And increasingly, the widespread use of geo-enabled devices is cr creating concerns about unwanted surveillance. The pace of technological change and also shifts in the adoption of these technologies is making it difficult to address these problems. But there is a body of literature investigating how geospatial methods can be used to address privacy and confidentiality concerns. Some of them use statistical uh, approaches and some of them use normative modeling techniques. Um, in the notes for this slide, I've included references to some of the relevant literature. I think improved informed consent procedures directly addressing geospatial risks, geospatial data risks and protections are greatly needed. So this is the last slide. What can NIH do? I invite you to consider four steps that you can take to support geo -meth geospatial methods in health research. First, engage with health research educators to make sure that geo spatial methods are required preparation for people who are coming into the field. There's been tremendous growth in the use of GIS in health, but GIS and geospatial methods are still not widely and deeply embedded in the education of public health professionals, epidemiologists, and health researchers. Most people still have no exposure to these methods, and they're critical. Second, support research linking groups of health researchers and health professionals in spatially extensive studies that use the same methods across multiple sites. Select the study sites carefully and investigate both the patterns and significant patterns of spatial error. 
think the days when we're doing a one-off study in a particular community using a highly specialized method, um, we, we might want to reconsider that. I, I wrote notes here. Don't harangue people. You know, be careful <laughs> what, what I'm saying. But, but um, they're doing this in Europe to, with great success. So s they'll have uh, 25 teams of researchers using, a, using a, the same land use regression model to predict atmospheric pollution uh, in different countries. They validate it against uh, actual observational data. They can analyze spatial error, and then that feeds back into building better land use regression models. Third, I would love it if you could improve the geocoding of items in PubMed along with spatial, a spatial search capability and develop a spatial data sharing platform. You could start now and go forward from NIH funded research so that it will be easy to answer questions about where studies were actually conducted, when they were conducted, and uh, what the method was, and to actually share spatial data that's already been uh, conducted. Um, and I think you already have keywords for articles that are in PubMed. Those keywords should include, <laughs> you know, the where and the time of the data collection, because otherwise we just can't search it. And I don't think that this is, maybe I'm wrong. I was working with Colette Hochstein, and I know there's a whole process. We were trying to get more of the terminology of some of these spatial methods in as search terms in the MeSH subheadings, and I understand there's a long process. but it could make it, if nothing else, the next time Congress calls and wants to know uh, how much, how many research dollars have we spent in Egypt, you'll be able to easily <laughs> answer that question and it won't be so hard. And finally, if you could get OHRP <laughs> to organize the training program on geospatial data, privacy, and confidentiality to improve practices, to set a research agenda, and, and to uh, have Center for Scientific Review staffers and reviewers participate, um, people at NIH, editors of journals, <laughs> um, and health professionals, and so on. And we in the health field need to be really engaged in the ongoing public policy debate about what's happening with data privacy. And I, I don't think we have been sufficiently. And I'm ready to take your questions, but please remember, if you remember nothing else <laughs> from this talk, that the space is part of the science. The location isn't something that just gets added on later. It's part of the data, and it should be part of the methods, too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Don't be afraid. Yes? Well, ta why don't you? Right. I think one pitfall that you would have to start with from the get-go is that if you're looking at somebody who is. Um, you know, my age, I'm going to be 58, and I live in Connecticut, but I didn't live in Connecticut all my life. So you, if, if you think the location has something to say about your patient's health, then it's, it's not, I mean, where they live now is something of interest, but it's not just where they live, it's where you work, it's maybe how you get to work, it's sort of the total um, life course and current sort of environment of the person. And we do have good spatial methods to uh, capture what's called like the activity space of the person. So if you think about your own life, 
you know, if you live in one place, which most of us do, although not everybody, and you work in one place, there's kind of like a spatial routine, right? You get up in the morning, you usually take the same route to work, you spend most of your day at work, and maybe there are a couple of other places you go. And so we've made a lot of progress in modeling that, what we would call the environment of the person. And now what we need to do is figure out better ways to group people who actually share the same environments because um, if you live with children or you have a spouse, even though you share the same residential location, you may actually circulate in very different parts of the Washington, D.C. space. I think another interesting question around that from the point of view of disease transmission is, is it the routine geography of the person? Or, I mean, I'm way out of my activity space today. Like the person on the plane who gets SARS, is it the, is it the unpredictable trip that you make that has an influences, influences the disease that diseases you're exposed to? We're at a disadvantage in the United States because we don't maintain detailed residential history data on most people in the United States. But in other countries of the world, particularly the Scandinavian countries, they have complete detailed residential histories for every person in the country. They can tell you <laughs> where everyone has lived, how long they've lived there. So it's actually possible to go back and recreate um, these types of trajectories through time and space. So you could go back and see not just are you living close to some facility now that's highly polluting, but did you live there during some critical period of your life? Um, so we need to kind of build time and space into it. And then the more spatially extensive the studies are, you know, the better we can look for errors or anomalies or things that don't um, make sense. The, um, I think that um, when I was growing up, my family had a general practitioner, and he came to our house. If I had an ear infection, we didn't go to the office. He came to our house and took care of us. And so think about what that does for a physician to really understand the environment of the patient, you know, the living environment. And most physicians today, I don't think, do that. When you see a patient, you, what is your spatial basis of evidence? It's the examination room and the person who's sitting in it. You've taken that person out of context. Now, family practitioners can find out a lot about the family context. You know, the sort of what you think of as the environmental context isn't the only relevant context. There's, you know, do you live alone? Uh, is your, did your son try to commit suicide three months ago? And so this is going to have an effect. Family practitioners can understand that context as well. And um, so those are, those are some of the kinds of things that I think we need to be aware of. And the, um, in, in the work that Patty is doing, you know, and in the, at the BSSR conference, the OpNet workshop that I was a facilitator at, across the board, whether it's gene environment, whether it's cultural influences, Everyone was saying the same thing. We have massive amounts of data that's coming from the new technology, and we don't know how to analyze it temporally and spatially. You even like think of a whole series of brain images or something. Um, so I think if we can start to come together, even though, you know, and, and try to work on these temporal and spatial issues, then, um, we, can, we can advance our understanding of things. I hope that's somewhat responded to your question. Linda? I think that many individuals who serve on IRBs, because of the education problem I mentioned in point one, are 
not as knowledgeable as they might be about these methods. And that's why I think we really need a massive education effort. I spent a lot of, when I worked at the Institute for Community Research, we had our own IRB, and I spent a lot of time just explaining to people, you know, uh, what we wanted to do. I think informed consent is the key, and I think you should be looking at this prospectively, going forward and saying to people, one, people need to be informed that any geographic data you're collecting about them, like where they live or whatever, is part of the data for the study. And I've been irritated in the past when I've looked at grants and people had contact information and then they suddenly realize they're sitting on spatial data and they can go back and geocode it. But those individuals are never consented that that address information was going to be used in that way. So we need to recognize the space is part of the science. It's part of the data for the study. And people need to have this specifically mentioned to them. They need to be told that they can refuse if they want to. And they need to be told about the risks to privacy. Like if you make a map showing individual locations, that can be reverse geo-coded. And it can be used to identify people. So explain that briefly. And you can come up with language for this. And then say what steps you are taking to ensure that you're not going to publish those kinds of maps. And that's why I included journal editors in this, because most of them don't understand it either. And, and this goes even beyond mapping. I mean, with your geo-enabled device, you know, even if they don't know anything about you, they can pretty much triangulate and get to pretty close to your home location. So the, the technology itself is, is moving rapidly away. So the answer to that is to say, you tell participants that, you know, this is going into a data sharing thing, and it's going in using this technique, this whatever masking, aggregation, whatever technique it might be to preserve the privacy and confidentiality. Or you may get somebody saying, OK, I don't care. Some people don't care. Many other people, like me, do. I, I'm very sensitive to all this stuff in my personal life. So that's where I think we need to be. But I, I don't think most people on IRBs are even there yet. And their inclination is to be very conservative, I think wisely. And if they don't understand it and they think there's a threat, then they just say no. So if we want this to happen, but if we could even just geocode, you know, come up with a good geo reference of where these studies were taking place. And you don't need a GIS to do that. You can go into Google Maps, you can pan over to India, you can find the little school on the Google Maps, and if you right click, and scroll down to what's here, the longitude latitude will come up. That's all somebody would have to do to give you a geocode for this place where this study occurred. Or you could zoom out and just do it to the town and put that in. And uh, There's a great book by Linda Hill called Georeferencing. She's a librarian. It's more complicated than that, but um, we need to push it in this direction. I just don't think we're even there yet, even close to being there yet with IRBs, but we need to give them this information. We really need to do this work. Right. No, most of the things I listed here are things, I think to me, they're trying to build off stuff you're doing already. Right? You already do PubMed. You already do keywords. We're just trying to tweak it. You already do human subject stuff. We just need to tweak that. It, and the I also want to say to people who work for the government, which most of you do, I was at a conference uh, sponsored by ESRI, which is one of the big software companies, maybe 15 years ago now in Washington. And a gentleman stood up and said, I work for a company that manages the prescription drug benefit for Anthem, somebody, somebody. And we have a database of every prescription um, written by our insurers in the United States. And I'm here to try to find out how to analyze these data. I almost fell off the podium, you know, because the message, another message I want to leave with you here at NIH, or if you're from CDC or whatever, believe me, the private sector has this information about us. They're using it, but they're using it in ways that we can't see because they're proprietary interests. And I don't know how you get at the regulatory thing around that. But if we're in a situation where lands end 
uh, because it knows about waist sizes on the trousers that are being ordered, has better body mass information than the CDC does, then I think we're in, we're in trouble, you know, because Land End isn't necessarily concerned with advancing the health of the people of the United States. They're concerned with making money from selling us pants. So, you know, the, we need to understand, I mean, and whenever students used to say, well, what good is it to study social science? I'm like, Believe me, businesses use social science all the time, um, you know, against us, or maybe not necessarily always to serve our interests. I've got to stop and leave time for more questions. Deb? I don't know if this is a, a stupid question or not. N no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. If, if, if you're asking a question you don't know the answer to, it's not a stupid question. So you mentioned how in some other countries they have good historical data on where people have lived throughout their entire lives. And so you can put the person in that place. And I, But my question is, do we keep what I would think would be equally important data about what is in those places? That's another huge problem, and I've harangued the other side of the, the table on this. Now, in s some areas are better than others. If you look at like weather and climate and some kinds of environmental data, we, we do have big, long kind of archives of that type of data at, at whatever scale, and there may be problems with it. But if you're looking at something like what is the structure of a public drinking water system in a particular place, these data have been managed using GIS systems now probably for 15 to 20 years by engineering departments and stuff. When they put in a new water main, they update their GIS database. I don't think they're saving the old stuff. So we have no way. We're not going to be able to go back. If we find that there was a contamination event 10 years ago, we're not going to be able to go back and say, well, what was the public drinking water system like 10 years ago when the event occurred? So that's not a stupid question at all. And we, I think that I have begged, um, you know, just h how come we still have this 1819 map of yellow fever hanging around? Because somebody saved it, somebody kept track of the metadata about it, where it came from, and somebody put it in the public domain. Um, it's an irony of the computer age that many of us actually have less access to less detailed geospatial information than we did to in the 1970s when a lot of stuff was paper. Um, so that's something we absolutely also have to be working on. It's not just the, it's not just the health community. And I also want to say that this problem is compounded in a country like the United States because we have a federal system of government. And even though people like to think that we have a really <laughs> strong central government in the U.S., compared to a lot of other countries, we really don't. Most things happen at the state level or the local level. Land use, for example, local level. In Denmark, I was at the Danish equivalent of USGS once, and they were giving a talk, and they, it was a small group. I was there with a bunch of map librarians. And they came out and rolled out this really old map that they had taken out of their archives. And they said the Danish cadaster, this is the map of like property records, dates to the ninth century. They can go back to the ninth century and figure out who owned parcels of land. In Connecticut, we have parcels that have never been surveyed. They've, they had meets and bounds descriptions and they've been handed down within families. And there's just this description like, okay, go to the big tree on the corner and then go, so, you know. So for all this technology, in many areas, we don't, we don't have um, good contextual data to hook onto that. Yes?
Thank you. Other questions or comments? Bill? As the young people who are going to get trained at the academy and whatnot, they're living lives that are much more uh, social and public and uh, uh, contribute to public database. <laughs> Given that these generations that are going to come up and replace us all, where do you think this There's a lot of interest, and I, I think you've even hosted some things here at NIH on kind of like crowdsourcing. Um, I know when we had the, some of the latest uh, kind of influenza outbreaks, people felt that the data that were coming, that were being crowdsourced and put up, were more uh, current or, you know, more uh, came out faster than what the CDC was putting out. So I think. Volunteer geographic information about all kinds of things is a definite um, possibility. But even so, we, we still have to take into account these kinds of privacy and confidentiality questions. Um, and while I think that's all great, I mean, in a sense, you could look at that Malaria Atlas project as a kind of crowdsourcing. They got a whole bunch of people together and they said, look, give us your, share with us what you've got. And the reason people were willing to share is because they knew they were getting something really good back that they couldn't produce on their own. So I think that that's coming. But at the same time, I think if you're about science, which is what NIH is, you also know that um, we do have to bring a certain kind of rigor to this. I mean, asking somebody, uh, have you ever had Lyme disease, you know, is a very different kind of mindset from having some type of agreed upon case definition for what Lyme disease is. And I'm, this is one of the reasons why Lyme disease is so hugely controversial. So we have to deal with that issue, I think, like how you can get good science from crowdsourcing. <laughs> because you've, you may have read things like on Google now, people are being paid to say that a coffee shop is closed when it isn't really closed. And we really need to think through, again, what is the basis of evidence? Because we're not just about science, you know, these technological bells and whistles. We're about science, and we need to make sure that whatever we're doing. The other point I would make about the young people is uh, one of the reasons Sarah and I wrote the first edition of our book, which came out more than 10, well, 10 years ago, is because we taught and we knew that if you wanted to get things taught, there had to at least be one textbook or a couple of textbooks. So we were hoping that if we wrote a textbook, we'd get more people teaching this in schools of public health and other areas. Um, there's definitely been a pushback uh, coming. And, and I went um, before a talk I gave this summer in Atlanta. I looked online at the most recent accreditation criteria you know, what you're supposed to teach people who are getting degrees in schools of public health and, you know, what the, what the curriculum should be and everything. There's not a single mention of community, the word community, neighborhood, GIS, geographic, no time space analyses. And I understand that, you know, there's a whole kind of politics around this, but I think it's a really serious issue in this country, you know, what and it's not that the universities don't have access to the software, and probably most schools of public health have computer labs and stuff now, but they're not required to take it. They're not required to know it. And so how many generations, even just over the last 10 years since we've had GPS and all that, how many generations, we've had, what, 10 classes of masters in public health students coming out over the last 10 years, most of whom have had no exposure to these methods. They also have no exposure to the U.S. Census, which is the main source of population data in our country and so on. So that's the educational issue. And you, can sp you at NIH can spend however much money you spend on a career development award getting somebody like me to help somebody like Blair out for free. I mean, I help him for free. He gets something out of it. That seems like a pretty inefficient way to me 
to educate people. I could see when these methods were new and people realistically could not have been expected to have been taught this when they were in school. But you know, when I first went to UConn, our cartography courses were hand drawing and photo reproduction of maps. We, and I'm, you know, that was in 1984. We had to make a decision when these new technologies came online, that they were revolutionizing our field and we had to get rid of the f dark room and the camera and the drawing tables and the mylar and the pens and we had to put in computers that could do this software. And I was already out. I had never been educated in this stuff when I was in graduate school, but we did it because we knew we had to. And I think we need to get there with health education. And thank you for letting me be so blunt. <laughs> uh, it's done. I know we're we're probably way over time.